This on? Yes. Good. All right. First hitch. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bill and Ken, for inviting me uh, to this excellent school. So, going to talk about ultra-fast powder diffraction. So, what on earth is that? What, what's it for? Well, powder diffraction, of course, is a very versatile technique, and we can use it to study things in situ, and in particular, we can use it to study the kinetics and the mechanism, the processes by which uh, things happen, things like chemical reactions. We can look at phase transition. We can look at the effects of external perturbations on systems, so light irradiation or strain applied, or any other irreversible or reversible processes. So that's what we're, we're talking about. But, but what is, what is ultra-fast, as Bill, as Bill showed, what was ultra-fast 10 years or 20 years ago is, is, is routine today. So ultra-fast I'm going to define uh, for today. Erichi 2011 is um, something on the millisecond or faster scale. So we want to be able to collect a series of useful, that means analyzable, powder diffraction patterns, patterns which actually have some information content at the rate of at least two per second, so one per 500 milliseconds. Uh, but of course, it's obviously going to be necessary and desirable to measure patterns possibly much faster, 200 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or faster. So we're going to be looking at irreversible processes where you, you start with some starting state, you go to an end state via possibly a series of intermediates. And to produce diffraction patterns with you know, information content, adequate statistical quality, we need, we need to have a lot of flux at the sample. We need a very efficient detector system. And quite possibly, we need a detector that uh, can follow the, the, the process as it goes through, so possibly a high-speed detector. Um, we can also look at reversible or cyclic processes, and here's a little bit easier because if the system is reversible, we can make multiple measurements. If we have a cyclic process, we can do a measurement at a particular time of a particular duration during the, the cycle, and we can repeat it, and we can repeat it, and we can add up those different signals to improve our statistics, and then we can move throughout the cyclic process uh, and measure at different places to build up a a full picture. This is called a stroboscopic uh, data analysis, and it's, uh, it's a very useful but, but somewhat distinct technique. When I say ultra-fast, um, we're not going to be using a standard uh, kind of diffractometer. I think Pam alluded to this, that uh, the, the standard laboratory instrument isn't really up to uh, up the standard. If you want to go ultra-fast in a car, you don't do it in your, in your Renault Clio. Uh, well, you shouldn't do. Uh, you have some apparatus which is rather specialized and rather, uh, you know, rather expensive as well uh, and fit for the purpose. So we're going to go to a very intense source, certainly one of the central facilities, a neutron source or a, a signatron radiation source, where there are a lot of photons or neutrons available. It's probably going to be advantageous to use very penetrating radiation, uh, hard energy x-rays or neutrons so we can uh, penetrate through sample environments, uh, use very large samples as well to increase the, uh, the signal in the detector. And we can use monochromatic or polychromatic radiation, um, but note that uh, if we're using highly monochromatic radiation, uh, we're actually wasting a large proportion of our radiation source. We reject in the monochromator uh, a large proportion of, of x-rays or neutrons which might be used to, uh, to probe the sample. So uh, there are some advantages to using polychromatic radiation, but uh, uh, both are, are permissible. And detectors, well, scanning a detector in a traditional powder diffraction way is just simply too slow to measure uh, diffraction patterns on the, on the millisecond scale. Uh, we require to measure the whole diffraction pattern simultaneously, so we need a multi-channel detector where we can see the whole pattern in one go. We may need to read this detector out very fast, millisecond time scale or, or quicker, and, uh, and as a general rule, if we want high despacing resolution, that's narrow peaks in our, 
in our standard angular dispersive pattern. This is just a way, high resolution is a way of rejecting photons or neutrons which don't actually uh, follow the correct flight path uh, that you want. So it's actually very expensive from the point of view of detector efficiency and signal. So we're actually going to have to degrade the resolution of our, of our experiment, which may be fine, but we're not going to be able to do the highest resolution, super high quality powder diffraction patterns on this kind of time scale. So I'll, there are sort of four basic ideas. We can, we can use monochromatic X-ray radiation. And the general approach is we can either use, uh, OK, X-rays come in, hit the sample. Debye-Shura cones are produced. And we can detect those on a, a flat 2D area detector. It's a very efficient detector system. Or as Fabio has already showed us, we can use a, a 1D detector and measure just parts of those those rings. Uh, it's more, this is more akin to an old-fashioned Dubai Shearer camera, but this is a, a going to be a very fast uh, dynamic detector. Fabio has already shown you the Mython detector, which is really the best uh, one of these curved PSDs that exists in the world. So successful indeed that the, the Swiss have managed to uh, export a couple. Uh, this is the equivalent device on the Australian synchrotron uh, in Melbourne. This is their powder diffractometer, and it's, it's, I think, 90 degree or slightly more Mython detector. These really do go very fast. And also the I-11 beamline at the Diamond Light Source in the UK has also got a, a 90 degree uh, detector, uh, specifically because they are so much more efficient than the standard high resolution scanning mode. And this is just another view of the I-11 detector. Here you see this Mython detector, and here you see the the high resolution, 45 channels of, of high resolution, uh, uh, very high resolution diffraction detection. Um, 2D detectors, um, we have one that has been developed at the European Synchrotron. Uh, it's called the Freelon camera, fast readout low noise camera. It's essentially a CCD chip with a scintillator screen in front of it. It produces. Uh, diffraction patterns, again, as recording debye shearer rings. And um, here's a picture of a rather old version of it. Essentially, you have a CCD chip, quite a large one. You have a, a scintillator window, which produces light by the arrival of the photons. And then you have some optics, often a fiber optic taper that conveys the light to the chip where it is uh, registered. And this, this this can be read out in, in, in say, 100 milliseconds for, for reading out the full chip. Of course, there's a lot of other detectors around. There's a medical imaging industry. When you go to the hospital now to have your, you know, your tennis elbow uh, x-rayed, they don't use a film anymore. They'll use one of these uh, medical imaging detectors. Uh, they, there are various manufacturers throughout the world. Trixel make a whole range of uh, medical detectors. Um, General Electric Healthcare make uh, this huge device. Um, it's 41 by 41 centimeters. They've got one at the, I, at the 11 IDB beamline at the advanced photon source synchrotron. Perkin Elmer make these. These work for hard x-rays as well. The Mython detector uh, is made of silicon, works at relatively low energies. This is for medical imaging. They put hard radiation through you to get through you and your medical imaging. These are sensitive to 60, 70, 80, 90 keV photons. The Petra 3, new synchrotron in, in uh, Hamburg, they have a new powder diffraction line there. They've just acquired one of these devices. And these can be read out very fast as well in the, the 100 millisecond time scale. So we're going to be using some quite dynamic detectors. Um, yeah, so this is just a blow up of one. You have a a glass coating to protect it. You have a scintillating layer, which is cesium iodide doped with thallium. And underneath, you have some very complicated uh, uh, microelectronics, transistors, diodes, uh, to convert the light into an electric pulse and an online readout. These are, these are actually not as expensive as you might imagine, because they are produced for a mass market medical imaging. Every hospital in the, in the land has one. So they're, they're less than 100 kilo euros. Rather an old-fashioned technique now is to use um, white X-ray radiation. The white radiation comes in from the synchrotron. 
is incident on the sample. And at a fixed 2 theta angle, there's an energy dispersive detector, which converts, can, can sense the photon energy coming in by looking at the size of the electronic pulse produced. And instead of traditionally using fixed lambda and varying 2 theta, we're working with the fixed 2 theta and determining lambda by the detector. These are rather slow, these detectors, and so uh, useful, but perhaps not as widely used as they were 10 years ago. And now we're on to neutrons. We've already seen a picture of D20, monochromatic neutrons. This is the D20 diffractometer at the ILL. Neutrons come in, are monochromated, and then detected by this huge um, position-sensitive detector. I'll show you a photo of it in a moment. Similar device at uh, the ANSTO in uh, Sydney, uh, the Wombat. Uh, Defractometer neutrons come in, are monochromated, and again are incident on this very large detector. These are, these are the neutron equivalents of the Mython detector. So here's a view of, of D20. This is shielding. In there, you see this huge detector covering 160 degrees in 2 theta. Here's a picture of it during assembly. You can see just what a vast uh, it is, uh, piece of apparatus that is. And similarly, the, the wombat detector, it's a bit smaller, but it's the same idea, very large uh, linear, sorry, curved um, position-sensitive detector. Here it is surrounding some sample environment. So these are very, very performing pieces of equipment. Uh, neutron time of flight, we've already had a very nice introduction to that. Obviously, to get uh, the biggest signal you need, as many detectors as possible. We've seen a picture of GEM, which is absolutely bristling with uh, detectors covering every single angle you can imagine. And there's a new one just been uh, opening up at the Oak Ridge called PowGen, which is supposed to cover some absolutely enormous uh, array of detectors. There's going to be 40 square meters of neutron detectors there when it's, when it's finally uh, in its final configuration, absolutely vast. And here's just uh, some of the knitting of the fiber optics. We, we saw it in uh, Laurent's talk uh, to convey the, the signals from these detectors to the, to the electronic analysis. Absolutely you know, impressive is not the word. The engineering and the care that goes into the design and manufacture and uh, putting into service these, these instruments. So that's the, the equipment we're going to use. And I'm, I'm just going to try and illustrate the scope of what's possible now. Um, but with some examples. So one of the things that has been studied and was studied a few years ago was, was combustion synthesis. This is a technique that uh, allows you to make uh, components in situ by mixing together ingredients and then exploiting a very high heat of reaction to cause the chemistry to take place, to cause the elements and the compounds, the starting materials to fuse. Um, and produce a very dense, sintered, strain-free uh, component, which all you have to do at the end is, is kind of just you know, polish it a bit and uh, knock off the rough edges. It's considered as a potentially very energy-efficient and uh, time-efficient mode of manufacture. There are really two, two ways of doing it. There's a self-propagating high-temperature synthesis mode where you light the top, you ignite it, and then a wave of reaction rushes through the sample. I've got a video to show you in a, in a second of, of how this goes on. Or there's a second approach, which is an explosion synthesis, where you, you take your component uh, and you just heat it up in an oven, and then the whole lot reacts in one, in one well, firestorm almost. And, uh, uh, and these happen very, very fast. So I'm about to show you a, a combustion synthesis. Um, we, we'll watch what happens as a, there's a pellet and, okay, that's it. That's what we're going to try and measure with our, with our powder uh, diffractometer, something that takes three or four seconds. Uh, if you want to look at it, here's another one. You can see that one's more interesting. There's a kind of uh, oscillation of the wave front, the reaction front. I've got it slowed down. So you can see how some of these, uh, these reactions can go in different ways. You see the... The reaction front is zipping to and fro. Um, so the question is, what's going on? We know the starting products. 
we know the end product and what's going on in between because it might be very useful to know what's going on in between so that we can control the whole process uh, rather better. It seems a bit uncontrollable at the moment. As scientists, we want to know, as chemists, what's happening in between. So the ID11 beam line at the, at the European synchrotron has, has spent quite a lot of time uh, studying these processes, uh, the self-propagating mode. So the beam comes from the synchrotron through the monochromator, so it's a monochromatic approach. So we choose a, a wavelength of uh, something like 45 keV. That's nearly, uh, no, that's, point, that's about 0.3 angstroms. Some slits to define the beam, maybe some focusing, the sample, and then this fast detector, this Freelon detector. So reading out, registering the, the two-dimensional Dubai Shira cones. Um, you ignite it, and you know what happens. You've seen the video, and, and this is what you might measure in something like 100, 100 milliseconds. You get uh, the Dubai Shira cones registered on the, uh, on the detector, and it's very easy to integrate around these rings. There are programs to enable you to do this and convert this two-dimensional image into a one-dimensional powder diffraction pattern. And there we are, there's a series of those. So we're starting off at ignition, ending up 10 seconds later with the final product. Um, time resolution is about 100 milliseconds, so 10, 10 images per second. And as you can see, uh, we can follow very easily what's happening in the solid state. There are the starting materials, there's something happening, there's something else happening. And this is perfectly adequate to be able to follow the, the broad details of of the chemistry that's taking place uh, in this sample. So we start off with, this one is in fact aluminium, nickel, titanium, and carbon in equistoichiometric uh, quantities. Uh, you can see the phase transition of hexagonal titanium into cubic titanium. You can see the formation of an intermediate phases of aluminium, nickel two titanium, and nickel aluminium. And eventually, those transform the heat I might add, as you can imagine, gets up to very high temperatures here, uh, well above 1,000 uh, degrees, possibly even 2,000. Uh, and eventually, the final products precipitate out nickel aluminium, titanium carbide, and a little bit of TiO2 impurity that uh, is done in air. Titanium mops up uh, oxygen, uh, just a little bit of impurity. So three or four seconds, we've got the complete reaction sequence. Um, we can go faster, actually, if I take any 2D detector and look at the, uh, the 2D image and I take any diameter perpendicular to that, um, the lines are, the Baishira lines, they're not really very curved. They're almost, they're almost straight. So if I mask my detector, I can simulate a one-dimensional position-sensitive detector. As you can see, the, the lines are essentially straight and perpendicular. So here's my diffraction pattern. It's uh, 2,048 pixels by 64 wide. And in fact, this is a CCD chip. It's just a, an electronic chip. We know what we can do with electronic chips. We can manipulate them. And it's possible on the chip to add up all these uh, channels together to convert it into a 2,048 times one channel tick uh, signal. And then we can read that out in five in one millisecond with a five millisecond acquisition time. And there we are, that line becomes a powder point there, that becomes that, and you can measure then a powder diffraction pattern in, in five milliseconds. And so we're measuring you know, uh, about 10 times faster than, uh, than we were before. This was used to, uh, to study the synthesis, again, a uh, combustion synthesis of jacobsite, iron manganese oxide, and uh, this shows the a reaction taking place, starting materials, various uh, changes, other changes during the course of the reaction. And we were knocking up something like 8,000 diffraction patterns in, uh, in about 50 seconds. So, uh, and if we look at the, you know, the pattern in more detail, you can see there's a, this is this first, um, first reaction, first step right at the bottom, right at the beginning. You can see there's, a, there's an awful lot of detail in this pattern. Um, 
and we can do root belt refinements. Uh, this is perfectly good for a, a root belt refinement. We've got lots of phases. We can analyze how much of the various starting materials and the uh, intermediates are there. Perfectly good powder diffraction. Five milliseconds of data, perfectly good root belt refinement. And you can follow the course of the reaction. You can see stuff going down, stuff coming up, and uh, you, know, you know what's going on. Here's, here's another example, um, the synthesis of titanium 3 silicon dicarbide. This was done on D20. Um, it was an explosion synthesis, so they heated up the sample, which was a large block, 20, uh, almost 20 grams of sample, 15 millimeters in diameter. 100 degrees per minute, and they collected data with a data acquisition of 300 milliseconds and 800 milliseconds readout. Here's the, uh, the series of, uh, of steps. Um, it, it's not starting from the beginning, but you can see various important steps. You can see titanium there, uh, titanium, alpha titanium, which is the hexagonal phase, eventually converting into the, the cubic phase. You can see the silicon carbide uh, reactant uh, staying put. And you heat up, you get to a certain temperature, and then wham, that's your explosion. Uh, the chemistry takes place. You get a very, very sharp increase in the quantity of well, what is a, a cubic titanium carbide-like phase. In fact, it's probably silicon dissolved in titanium carbide. There's about uh, a few seconds whilst this uh, kind of stabilizes, and then the product uh, grows from that, nucleates and grows. Um, the titanium carbide phase fades away, and the final product grows there. Um, you can follow all that by a, a Rietveld refinement. Um, you can see what's going on at the beginning. This is wham, this is the reaction. There's a, a pause whilst things stabilize, and then the titanium carbide phase fades away, and the the final product grows from that. And you can analyze this. You can look at those curves, and you can, you can do what people do. You can fit a Varami-type fit to it. Um, the temperature is changing throughout this whole process, so you have to, to modify the way you do your a Varami fit. You can actually estimate the temperature from looking at the lattice parameters of all the various components in there. But if you combine an Avarami type uh, expression with, a, with a, an Arrhenius type pressure uh, expression, which tells you how activation energy varies as a function of temperature, you can actually fit the rate of uh, disappearance of the one phase and the arrival of the other really quite successfully. And it enables you to extract uh, kinetic information, thermodynamic information. You can estimate about 45 kilojoules per mole activation energy for the nucleation uh, of, the, uh, of the final phase uh, from the intermediate. You can go beyond that, and you can actually get the heat reaction by, by looking at the whole process as it cools down and estimating the temperature from the lattice parameters. You would normally expect a normal exponential decay. And what you see is there's a real deviation from that. This is subtracting off the the exponential, you get a real bump. Uh, this is like a DTA experiment, differential thermal analysis. There's some more heat being produced in the system as the, uh, the final product precipitates out. And you can use this data to estimate a heat of reaction of, of 75 kilojoules per mole for the final product. So this is really information you would have great difficulty achieving by any other means. So you can get a lot of information if you're careful with your analysis. And you know, these are not high-resolution patterns. These are really fairly basic. OK, we go on to some more, some more chemistry. Um, catalysis. Catalysis is something that powder diffraction is extremely good at uh, looking at. You can do in situ studies. You can look at uh, uh, reactions in situ. And this, this was uh, an experiment carried out by the a at the APS. Um, by Pete Chupas and his, his co-workers, who were looking at the study, studying the growth of platinum nanoparticles on a titania support. Platinum nanoparticles, as we all know, are extremely good at catalyzing a whole range of uh, chemical reactions. And they, uh, 
the way they're deposited and the way they grow is of great importance in defining their final property. So they were looking at the production of these plat platinum nanoparticles on a support, and they were doing it by fast time-resolved pair distribution function analysis. So Simon is going to tell us all about pair distribution function analysis. It's very much uh, an up-and-coming technique in the powder diffraction world. And they were doing this, uh, you know, with very fast time resolution. Uh, generally, PDF, pair distribution function, requires data of very good statistical quality to very high Q values. And we're going to do that, good quality data to high Q values, and do it very fast. So this is a very challenging experiment. What they did was they produced uh, their titanium support and put some uh, hydroplatinic, hydrochloroplatinic acid on it. And this was going to be reduced in situ by, by hydrogen gas. There was 5% by weight of, the, uh, of, the, of platinum in the sample. And they made measurements uh, on two beam lines, one IDC and 11 IDB at hard energies. This is uh, 77 keV, 60 keV, short wavelength X-rays. And they use one of these flat panel detectors I showed you earlier with a time resolution of 133 milliseconds. And then they did this at different temperatures. And uh, in fact, because of the titanium oxide background, ultimately you actually subtract that off. So you're kind of doing a differential uh, PDF uh, a measurement. So PDF, I think you all know what it is. If you don't, it's a, you take your powder diffraction data, you Fourier transform it, and that gives you uh, a graph which gives you the number of intermolecular uh, or interatomic interactions. It's kind of a graph of how many atoms at what distance. And uh, from that, you can gain a lot of information about the sample. So this is, this is, this is the PDF. So this is the distance. And that's saying that there are an awful lot of, uh, at 1.9 angstroms, there's an awful lot of atomic atomic uh, near neighbor interactions. And that's interpreted as the TiO2 substrate. At about 2.4 angstroms, you can see a much weaker signal there, which is actually fading away over the course of the experiment. You can see it dies away. And that's seen as the platinum chlorine interaction. And then here you can see it. 2.8 angstroms, the growth of the platinum-platinum nanoparticle interactions. And of course, the, the equivalents at, at larger d-spacings. If you chop off the background and do the differential, you can see more clearly this is the platinum-chlorine interaction. And it dies away very, very fast. And the growth of the platinum-platinum nanoparticle interactions. So the um, to cut a long story. Long story short, the intensity, the strength of that platinum chlorine peak tells you how fast the platinum is being reduced by the, uh, the hydrogen. And the growth of the platinum, the other peak, the platinum zero, platinum zero, uh, depends not only on the amount of platinum you're producing, but also the size of the particles that you're producing. If you produce isolated atoms, they don't have any near neighbors. So the peak is very weak. As a particle grows in size, so the number of neighbors it has grows accordingly. So actually, it's possible to look at the production of the platinum and, to some extent, the size of the particles. So this shows that uh, for face-centered cubic standard platinum, a spherical particle, if the cluster size, how many near neighbors uh, a platinum atom has. As you can see, as particles grow, so the, uh, if you like, the efficiency of the particle-particle interactions grow. Uh, this shows the uh, different temperatures at 100 C, 150 C, 200 C. Uh, the disappearance of the hexachloroplatinic acid, um, relatively slow at 100 C, very, very fast at, at 200 C. These give you essentially zero order kinetics. And if you fit the kinetic uh, rate constants to an Arrhenius plot, then it tells you uh, an activation energy. So you can, uh, you can estimate that the reduction of, of this by hydrogen is about 50 kilojoules per mole. When you look at the platinum-platinum zero correlations, at 200 and 150 C, you could see they grow very rapidly and then essentially saturate. 
whereas the, at 100 C, it doesn't really, really make it. It's very slow, and um, it, it isn't ever going to saturate at the same level of that. And the idea, perhaps, is that here, because the temperature isn't high enough, uh, the platinum doesn't have sufficient mobility for the particles really to grow to a proper size, and they stay rather stunted and rather small. And uh, to get around this, they did a temperature ramp experiment, ramped up to 200 C in one hour, monitoring the PDF and um, monitoring the, uh, the different correlations. So this is just a view of the data. Nothing much happens till you get to about 130 C when suddenly there's a dramatic growth of, of the platinum zero, platinum zero signal. You can see here the platinum chlorine interaction dies away to about 140. And the growth of the particles, nothing happens very, very sluggishly. And then at about 130, it takes off and grows very rapidly. So I mean, this tells you immediately that the particles don't grow properly until you get to 130 degrees centigrade. And uh, uh, ultimately, by looking at the PDF, uh, you can see that the maximum particle size you attain is about 65 angstroms, which is where the PDF function essentially runs out of structure which means there are no correlations bigger than that, which is obviously highly linked to the size of the particle. OK, just uh, some things to end with. Metallurgy, um, you can use uh, high, resolution, uh, high time resolution powder diffraction to study all sorts of metallurgical processes. I've, I've given you some notes and some references in the notes. I'm not going to discuss them here. I'm going to just finish on the stroboscopic measurements. Um, uh, because that's a, a kind of a different approach to getting very, very high time resolution. This is an in-situ diffraction study of some piezoelectric actuators. These are uh, things like PZT, um, lead zirconium titanate, a piezoelectric material, uh, which is many applications in, in modern technology. For example, fuel injectors in, you know, in, in, in ordinary cars have uh, piezoelectric uh, applications. This was actually a commercial sample, so it had added ingredients. And it was studied under cyclic electric fields and by static electric fields, and also um, uh, by st straining it. The, the actual mechanical response is due to intrinsic effect of the, uh, of the electric field on the lattice, which is, which is polar. And also, its tetragonal structure, slightly distorted test, tetragonal perovskite, you get switching between the A and the C axes. These are called non 180 degree domain switching, because it's a 90 degree domain switching. There are all sorts of processes which go on in, in these, which, these materials which people would like to understand. Uh, and these were studied, in fact, it was done in Australia on the Wombat. Uh, Diffractometer, they were measured in cyclic fields of up to 500 hertz, static fields up to 1.2 kilovolts. And the way the experiment was done was that each incoming neutron uh, was simply time stamped. So you knew when it arrived, and it could be done with a precision of about 30 microseconds. And then knowing the cyclic electric field being applied, you could just add up the neutrons, which uh, corresponded to the, the right part of the uh, the high voltage cycle. So we're actually going to have time resolution here of 30 microseconds. This is just a, a quick picture, which I won't dwell on, of an initial experiment ramped from, from uh, no volts up to 1.2 kilovolts and back down again. There's a usual sort of hysteresis that you expect from, from these materials. To get it back down, you have to go uh, put, the, put the potential in the other direction. And this is the effect of, of cyclic fields. Um, they were done at one hertz, so half a second on, half a second off, half a second on, half a second off. Each one of these dots is a measurement. 10 hertz, so 20th of a second on, 20th of a second off. Again, lots of measurements. 100 hertz, lots of measurements. 500 hertz, lots of, uh, lots of measurements. Well, the, Actually, it's not very interesting. Well, it is interesting because uh, you see, first of all, they, the frequency has absolutely no effect. Um, that they all, the strain uh, all goes to the same value, and that there's no, there's no lag in the, uh, in the switching. 
The switching takes place in about 30, 30 microseconds within the time resolution of the experiment. Um, but it's a, it's a remarkable experiment. Look at all those measurements. Each one is 30, 30 microseconds of, of this powder diffraction pattern. Um, so the conclusion here was that there was no time dependence of the, the strain, neither with the response time nor, nor the maximum strain value, which is actually different from other samples, depending on what the exact uh, recipe is for making these. The ingredients, the, the trace elements, the doping, they can behave quite differently. So the idea was that these strains are, in this material, were mainly intrinsic, or that they were correlated with the, uh, the switching of A and C axes at such a rate that uh, um, within the resolution of the experiment. But this, coupled with all the other measurements they made, this gave them actually a great deal of insight into the in the electromechanical response of, of this, this material, and it's, uh, it's a relatively uh, uh, impressive to be able to get this kind of time resolution from, from, such, a, from such an instrument. So finally, last three minutes um, or so, uh, we know neutrons can be pulse sources, and Fabia also mentioned it, that synchrotrons are, are also pulse sources. Um, they have, and um, this is the, the European synchrotron, in Grenoble, the storage ring, electrons are actually in little bunches, and they're whizzing round and round and round here. And uh, they're producing pulses of, um, of X-rays. And a storage ring like the ESRF, you can fill it up in different ways. This is, the, this is my way of filling it up with PowerPoint, and you can see there's a rather random <laughs> pulse structure. Um, the people who drive the machine can, can fill it up in lots of different ways, and one way they fill it up is a 16 bunch mode where they put 16 equally spaced bunches circulating around the ring. And this then delivers a pulse of X-rays of 70 picoseconds duration every 176 nanoseconds. OK, that's, uh, that's 16 bunch. That's the 16th the circumference of the ring divided by the speed of light. Um, on a beam line such as ID9B there, um, you can exploit this time structure. You don't have to take every pulse that comes along by using a chopper. You can ch select every nth pulse. And they do pulse probe experiments where they, where they uh, excite a sample, possibly with a laser, synchronize to the, the source, and then allow the x-rays to come along a fixed time later um, to probe what has happened structurally. Uh, so this is a pump probe experiment. This is a a kind of schematic of the, the experiment. Uh, you have a sample. You have x-rays which are registered on a, on a detector. It doesn't have to be a very fast detector, because we're going to do this repeatedly. So you send in a laser pulse of about 300 femtoseconds duration. It excites the sample. And you arrange this pulse to arrive a few picoseconds or nanoseconds before the x-ray pulse from the ring arrives. And so rather than using the detector to define your, your time resolution and your time window, uh, you're actually using the source to define your, your, your time resolution. And then you just accumulate diffraction patterns for 20 minutes, half an hour. Just do this repeatedly. And uh, you, can, uh, you can measure what the effect of the laser, the pulse on the sample has been. So this is a, a material that Simone Teschert uh, investigated some years ago. It's called um, it's dimethyl, uh, what is it? Dimethyl amino benzonitrile. That's not its proper UPAC name, but that's the name they use. It's a molecule that that looks like this. So there's an iso two isopropyl groups on the amine group, and chemists amongst you will concede that there's probably good opportunities for conjugation between that nitrogen through the benzene ring, off to the cyanide group, and. Uh, that means that this torsion angle here is very close to, to planar. It's actually 14.3 degrees from a, from a single crystal structure determination. And this stuff absorbs uh, uh, light. It has a, a very interesting uh, uh, absorption spectro uh, optical spectroscopy. And they were interested to know, well, what happens when this absorbs light? Does it affect the structure? What happens? So they did this. They, um, they put some of this in the beam. They uh, flashed it with laser light and investigated uh, at times of 60 picoseconds, 50 picoseconds after the flash, uh, what the powder diffraction pattern was. 
They allowed, you, allowed many of these to accumulate, and here's the powder diffraction pattern that you can measure from that. That's really not bad at all. And then you can do a re belt refinement on that. And for example, uh, if you look at the data collected 60 picoseconds after, after the laser flash, you find that four, about 4.5% four of these molecules, you know, the fit is, is optimum when you allow 4.5% of these molecules. This, you refine the proportion, has this torsion angle, not 14 degrees, but, but 10 degrees. So it's actually causing a, a, a shift in the charge from there to there, which is affecting the conjugation, which is allowing this bond angle to to change slightly. I'm going to stop now. So uh, just to show that uh, you can measure this at times from naught up to whatever you want uh, in terms of picoseconds. Um, we were measuring about there. And it's just an exponential decay after the initial flash. The sample decays back to its ground state. And from that, you can, uh, you can find that the decay constant, the half-life, is about 6.3 nanoseconds. And if you do this from spectroscopic approaches, you you actually get a remarkable agreement, considering this is occupancies from a Rietveld refinement of uh, data collected uh, in a few picoseconds. So I should finish there. Just, just one thing to, to say. You produce an awful lot of data doing this. If you can collect uh, 8,000 patterns in 50 seconds, you know, just think how many patterns you collect when you get three days beam time. Um, there's a lot of data. You have to be very careful analyzing it. We're going to hear a lot more about data analysis. You can analyze these patterns individually, which takes forever. You can re analyze them in series. Rietveld programs allow you to do this, or, or even in parallel. And, uh, but whichever way you, you decide to do it, do do it, because I know these experiments are fun, and it's nice to have the data. But ultimately, you need to be able to extract meaningful information, which is you know, the aim of, of, of all these experiments. So I will stop there. So thank, thanks to Andy for this very clear overview of the different timescales where we can do powder diffraction. So again, uh, the floor is open for questions. Please. First of all, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, my name is Ahmed Nabit, uh, Secondary University Japan student. Uh, actually, my question, when we talk about this, uh, uh, really important experiment. I want to talk about detectors. Yeah, I, I can't. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Further back. Uh, it's okay. Okay. That's ah, better. <laughs> nice. Uh, again, my name is Ahmed. So, uh, Kandai University, Japan. I'm a student. Uh, just my question about uh, when we talk about different kind of uh, detectors, what is the main advantage in using area detectors in such kind of experiment? Right. The, main, the main advantage of the area detector, detector is actually it detects a much greater solid angle. Huh. It's, uh, so you collect the whole ring. Hmm. So when, you're, if you, when you need good statistics for very fast time resolution, hmm. you're, you're, you're registering more photons. Uh, your statistics are, are better, so you can go faster. Hmm. The other advantage is, uh, if you like it with the medical detectors, are that they're relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. that they are mass-produced. Yeah. Um, but uh, the disadvantage is, of course, that they, they only cover a limited angular range. Mm -hmm. So something like the Mython detector is a curve, so you'll go to 120 degrees or 90 degrees. Oh. The area detector you know, is rather it's 40 centimeters. It's only got a, a oh. much smaller angle that way, so you have to work with very hard energy to get a reasonable Q range. So I think we have another question from is it Henrik. Yeah, that'd be me. Uh, what uh, software was used for this for creating these pair distribution functions? Uh, the, the pair distribution functions. I mean, Simon will be uh, will be uh, Simon Billinge will maybe it's his software. Uh, he will be demonstrating it. He will be telling you you know everything about it. So it was it was the standard package at the time, and and still is pretty much the standard. Is still the the standard package. Uh, Leszek Zatkowski, Polish Academy of Science, Kraków. Uh, have you tried texture uh, development, time resolved? Because if you are using a real detector, you almost have information for uh, studying the texture. I mean, certainly, 
a 2D detector can give you texture information. Uh, whether you would integrate... I mean, recrystallization problems, maybe problems of recrystallization. I mean, I if there are sort of like, you know, spotty grains and things like that, those can be, uh, those will show up. So, I mean, you, you are right that it does give you uh, extra information about uh, the morphology, the microstructure of the, uh, of the sample as you go on. Now, you, you may wish to exploit that information or you may find that, oh, there are lots of big spots all over the place, actually something that you know, is impeding your analysis, but at least the information is there. So, no, I mean, that's a, that's a good point that there is this, this extra information. Uh, Saul Lapidus, Stony Brook University. So yesterday there was a whole bunch of talk about data provenance, and you're creating 8,000 data sets in one experience, experiment. How do you deal with, you know, keeping all those data sets in the correct order and, you know, all those issues? <laughs> um, well, uh, I mean, they all have a time in them, so we want to keep them in the right order. Um, they're all time stamped. So you can resort them. No, but I mean, it, they should increment normally. The normal file structure and the, uh, uh, the naming nomenclature and the headers should, should keep them in the right order. But you're, you're right. If, if, if you wanted to provide metadata for all of those, you could very easily uh, have a very difficult uh, task of uh, keeping tabs on. I mean, you need to keep scrupulous notes as to what you're actually doing as well when you're doing these kinds of experiments. But they will normally come in a, in a file which is a sequential file, and as long as you don't go in there and edit it or do something, you know, sort of suicidal, uh, <coughs> you know, the, the electronics, the computing should more or less keep them, <coughs> you, know, in, 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 you know, in the right order. Yes. But, uh, yes, is that right? So we still have time, there's one, one more there. I'm Paul Smart from the University of Sheffield. Um, it, I realize it's a bit of an open-ended question, but how do you go about doing reed build refinements on 8,000 structures? Oh, well, I mean, there'll, be, there'll be people telling you how to do this, I think. I mean, there, 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 are, there are several, there are two main approaches. One is, which I, I you could say in series, so you kind of set up an automatic system. You, you fit, say, the first one, and then you take the output of that as the input of the next one and let the process go automatically. And so it processes that. The output of that becomes the input of the next one. OK, that works until you hit a phase transition, you know, in which case the output of one isn't suitable for the input of the other. So you have to kind of do the refinement at the key points and then let it automatically uh, you know, sort of grind through the others. OK, you have to keep, you don't just you can go away and have coffee, but you have to look very, very critically at you know, the numbers that come out of it. Um, a, an alternative way is to do them in parallel, where you fit many patterns simultaneously, like, like fitting a, a surface, and you can tie parameters together. To Topaz is good at this. Um, I think some of the other programs can do this now. So instead of, say, fitting the the lattice parameter as a function of temperature, you, uh, at each temperature you, you fit the thermal expansion coefficient and let that drive the, the lattice parameters between patterns. So these are, these are different approaches and both have their, their strengths. Um, but uh, I think you must be very critical of the output as well. Look at it very carefully and reap velt. When you're working with high resolution data, you know, we, you know, you can get some strange things come out of it if you're not careful, and it's amplified those problems with, with lower quality data. So be highly critical. I think you might use the key square as a kinetic parameter. No, that was just a stupid comment, sorry. <laughs> I think if we don't have any more burning questions, we have time for a poster session together with lunch. <laughs> <laughs>